Welcome to those who have arrived on time. Thank you for being here. We're going to kick things off in just a minute. I'll give folks a moment or two to trickle in. So appreciate your patience. I'll be with you momentarily. All right, it is 3.01, pretty close to the top of the hour. With that, I think we'll go ahead and kick things off. Let's get started. For everyone who's here, welcome. Thank you for joining us for today's presentation. It's as odds made your market update, a halftime report, if you will. We're glad you could join us today live. We look forward to taking your questions later on. But first, a quick look at our speakers for today. I'm Josh Brockwell, Investment Communications Director here at Azad. I handle all things marketing and also spearhead our shareholder advocacy program. And joining us today, a special guest, Joe Cortese, partner at Fiducian Advisors. Fiducian, for those of you who are unaware, is Azad's Outsource Chief Investment Officer, or OCIO. Thank you for being here today, Joe. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Coming through loud and clear. Excellent. So first, before we hear from Joe, who will be delivering the bulk of today's presentation, a brief word about Azad Asset Management. For more than a quarter century, Azad has been helping high-income professionals build their wealth in accordance with Islamic values. Today, we manage over $1.5 billion for families all across the United States. What makes us odd unlike many other financial firms is the quality and nature of our advice. It's centered around you and your family, driven by a higher purpose and designed to help give you peace of mind, knowing that your financial life is on track. As you may already know, we like to consider ourselves your family's chief financial officer. We believe financial freedom comes from knowing you're maximizing all of your planning options. Our process starts by getting to know you, your needs, what matters most to you, and also your risk appetite. Then we help you focus on matters that you can control and where we can make the greatest impact, like tax management, charitable and estate planning, and investment risk. We'll organize everything for you in a financial plan so you can track and measure your progress every single year. No matter what st stage of your financial journey you're on, we can help give you that financial clarity. Quick word about recognitions and awards. Last year was our first time being named to the CNBC Financial Advisor 100. That's an annual ranking of top advisors in the United States. We're regularly listed in Financial Advisor Magazine's RIA ranking. Uh, we were just named there again for 2024. And our investment strategies are consistently named to the PSN Informa list of top guns performers. Visit our website, azadasset.com, for more information about the methodologies for each of those awards. Now let's think, uh, sorry, let's turn things over to Joe Cortese at Fiducian for a look at the markets through the first half of last year. Joe, take it away. Great. Thank you, Josh. Again, appreciate the opportunity to be here and thanks everybody for joining the webinar this afternoon. Excited to speak with you about uh, what we, Fiducian, are seeing in the markets through the first half of 2024 and uh, how we may position ourselves going into the back half of the year as well. So I'm gonna talk about a few things today, uh, just give you a few different points uh, uh, following some of the main themes that we're seeing in markets today. I'm sure you all are hearing about most of those. So Josh, if you wanna flip forward to the first slide here in the presentation, a uh, couple of the main themes we're watching, of course, interest rates and Federal Reserve interest rate policy and inflation. And um, you know, interest rate policy uh, kind of, uh, uh, it, with respect to the chart on the left, the graph on the left, 
presents us with some opportunities, particularly in the fixed income market. And what we're showing here in the chart on the left is there is an attractive skew in the bond market today. What I mean by that is this chart on the left, it's looking at for different maturities of bonds, you see there on the left-hand side, you've got your U.S. Treasury 30-year, U.S. Treasury 10-year, Bloomberg Aggregate, which is the sort of core bond market index, U.S. Treasury 5-year and U.S. Treasury 2-year. And then we're measuring if interest rates were to go up by 1%, what would the expected return be for those different maturities of bonds? And then if interest rates were to go down by 1%, what would the expected uh, return be uh, on, on those same uh, maturities of bonds. And so as you can see in the chart, there's a very attractive skew, as I said, in the bond market. If interest rates go up from here in the green, you would see some losses in longer term securities, certainly 30 year and 10 year. Bloomberg aggregate, you know, kind of flattish down a percent or so, and then five and two year would be relatively stable. But if interest rates drop from here by 1%, look at the expected total return that would be available in the bond market. You'd see a 20% return from treasury from 30-year treasuries, a 12% return from 10-year. The core US bond market would be up about 11%, so on and so forth. So we talk a lot about this chart when we get questions from clients about, hey, I can get five and a half percent on cash. Why shouldn't I just be in cash today? And and this chart gives us a good illustration of why you can miss out on some of the potential return that's available in other markets if you're just sitting in cash uh, because uh, you know the cash eliminates the, avail the ability to participate as interest rates go down. And again, just another very important indication of where we stand in the interest rate cycle and in the Fed policy cycle. Interest rates are much more likely to come down from here than they are to go up from here. And so that's a very important point and we're positioning portfolios accordingly. And it has implications across markets, not just not just within the bond market as well. Another Can thing I mention that, really, really quick sure. here, Joe, sorry to interrupt, but obviously for his like clients, they're going to be focused on halal fixed income, which right. is going to be in, in some ways a little bit different from a conventional bond, but it will uh, conceivably take advantage of some of that upside you're talking about, provided that rates do drop. So, for example, the Azadwise Capital Fund, which is our halal fixed income product, it's a higher quality, shorter duration product, uh, but it's going to it's going to offer uh, Sharia sensitive or halal investors uh, exposure to that to that trend that you're speaking to as well. Just wanted to point that out real quick. Yeah, thank you for clarifying that. And it's also just really important from a top down macro perspective in terms of where we are in the cycle, because Fed policy and what the Fed does from here is going to be a very important contributor to how the economy performs, how markets perform, so on and so forth. And we'll talk a lot about that as we go through the rest of the presentation. The chart on the right. Obviously, inflation has been front and center for a couple years now and something we've been following very, very closely. And we're pointing out a couple things in this chart. Let me go through what this is looking at. So the green line is the all items consumer price index, the CPI that many of you may have heard about or may be familiar with. The red line is the all items less food and energy. So it strips out food costs and energy costs, which tend to be more volatile. You may have heard this referred to as core CPI. And in fact, the, ped, the Fed pays more attention to the red line, the core CPI, than they do the green line, because again, uh, core uh, CPI tends to be more stable, stripping out a couple of the more volatile uh, uh, metrics within the, within, the, within the readings. And then the purple line is shelter, housing costs and shelter costs. And so what we're showing here is one of the reasons why the inflation reading has remained sticky higher for longer than many folks uh, may have expected is just by nature of the way shelter costs are calculated in the CPI, both the all items and the core CPI metric. And really the simplest way to look at this is look at the left part of this chart. You can see that the all items green line and the core items red line peaked prior to the beginning of 2022. But you see the purple line shelter doesn't peak until the beginning of 2023 and with shelter making up shelter costs making up a large component of the overall C cpi index and how it's calculated the, the the lagged nature the sticky nature of shelter and housing costs is one of the reasons why the consumer price index reading has remained higher than folks may have anticipated uh, but we also now see that coming down so that's a good news, and it's continued to trend. It has continued to trend down since the middle of 2023, and in fact, the last reading that we got 
uh, the all item CPI was down to uh, 3%, which is the lowest that it's been in a very long time. So you can move forward a slide, Josh. A couple of other things we're watching. Um, one of the things that I'll mention is we are seeing we are seeing a bit of a slowdown uh, across the U.S. economy, notwithstanding today's GDP report, which came in at 2.4 percent for the second quarter, which is actually considerably higher than expectations. And if you look at the chart on the left, this is exactly what we're showing as GDP over the last three years or so on a quarterly basis. And you can see that in the first quarter of this year, the right, the last, the right hand uh, side of the chart, the last reading on the right there, down to 1.4%. And we hadn't seen a reading like that since 2022. Um, so we've had, we've had some positive growth um, and, and it's remained positive throughout this period, but we did see a decline in second quarter. Now, again, as I said, uh, third, uh, I'm sorry, that's the 1.4 is the first, first quarter reading. We did see a, uh, an increase for the second quarter reading to 2.4%, which is great, higher than expectations. Um, but, uh, but it doesn't uh, mean that we're uh, so, you know, sort of out of the woods completely overall. And one of the charts that would um, counterbalance the GDP reading that we got this morning is the chart on the right. This looks at the labor market, and it looks at the current unemployment rate, which is about 4%, over the 12-month moving average. And any time that ratio has been positive, meaning the current unemployment rate is greater than the 12-month moving average, it has typically happened really close to the beginning of a recession. As you see, when this green line spikes up and then, um, and then the green shaded portion right in that same uh, area shows that, again, as, uh, whenever this ratio spikes up, uh, we tend to see a recession follow. Now, um, if you look at the right-hand side of the chart, the, the, the line has certainly increased from, from COVID levels, which is that spike down you see there. Uh, and we're not, we haven't spiked up into the area where, you know, you see recessions historically. But the point is, is that this line has trended up since 2020. And if continued, if continued the upward trend would put us into territory where a recession would become more likely than it maybe is today. Moving forward. Take a look at a couple other metrics here, just talking about a bit of slowdown in the US economy overall. The chart at the top left, these are PMI levels, PMI standing for Purchasing Managers Index. So uh, businesses and, and the things that they're buying in order to you know, make the goods that they're building and, and, and create the products for, client, for customers, uh, that's what these lines signify. And so you see manufacturing in green, you see services in red, and you can see that it's been trending down pretty substantially since uh, the end of 2021, early 2022. And then whenever that line is below, whenever the, the, the red and the green lines are below 50, 50 means neutral, means uh, manufacturing activity and services activity is neither increasing or expanding nor contracting. So you see when the line is, uh, when, the, when the red and green lines are below the midpoint there, the 50 straight line, that signals contraction territory, activity is declining from pre previous periods. And we saw that certainly within manufacturing uh, services has, has bounced around a little bit around that line uh, and, and today just fell a little bit short of that. So we do see a little bit of contraction within general manufacturing and services activity overall. And then the chart on the right, consumers are really important to the US economy. Consumers drive 70% of GDP. We are a consumer centric economy, the things you all and everybody buys on a daily basis drive the majority of economic activity. So we get worried when we see things like uh, uh, default, uh, uh, defaults and delinquencies on loans start to increase, particularly within credit cards, which is the purple line there, and within auto loans, which is the green line there. And you can see uh, that those are starting to trend upward um, since about the end of uh, 2023. Um, and so you know, one of the, the, the drivers of this is, is that the, 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 all the additional liquidity um, that folks received during COVID has essentially been spent now. It was a tremendous amount of money. It really boosted the, uh, bolstered the U.S. economy for a long period of time. But uh, we start to see that that is now coming down um, and, and, and we've kind of run out of that liquidity. And so now you're starting to see, you know, the best way to describe it is folks are having to take out the credit card more often and, and put things on a uh, borrow in order to fund purchases. And that always uh, gets a little bit worrisome when we start to see those levels increase substantially. If we move to the next slide, um, again, those are a couple of the main themes that we're looking at, namely 
interest rates, inflation, overall economic activity. Are we going to have a recession? When will we have the recession? We know we will have a recession. We just don't know when it's going to be. And, and we don't try to predict that because it's, 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 it's something that cannot be predicted. Um, and so what we look at here is just how markets around the world are doing generally. And again, I'll talk a little bit about bonds, understanding the nuances with um, most of Azad's clients, but it's still important to understand what's going on in the fixed income market because it has implications for, for other markets as well. Um, and the bond section is blue, equities are in gray there in the middle, and then real assets, things like real estate, commodities, natural resources are in uh, light blue there uh, to, toward the right. And so what we can see is that interest rates have been relatively stable throughout the year. If you go in, I'll skip a couple categories and go the third one from the left, U.S. core bond. So that's that same core intermediate term U.S. bond market that I talked about in the first chart that we that we looked at. And you can see that uh, that market had basically a flat quarter in the second quarter, up about 10 basis points, and still a little bit negative year to date to the tune of about negative 70 basis points or so. So interest rates have bounced around in a pretty tight range overall so far this year, and that's led to muted, uh, slightly negative returns on the core bond side. Uh, skip over one more and look at high yield or corporate high yield bonds there. Um, the best, one of the best performing fixed income asset classes uh, so far this year, up a percent for the quarter and up close to 3% for the year. What this tells us is that even though core bonds are down a little bit for the year, overall the bond market is still signaling that it's relatively healthy and functioning normally. If that were not the case, if there was some real risk and fear in investors' minds uh, participating in the bond market today, you would see high yield uh, not doing better than traditional bonds because high yield tends to be uh, a more risky part of the bond market. So in, in, in the periods of you know, real fear, real, real disruption in the bond market, high yield tends to sell off faster and to a much greater degree than core bonds. So what we can say from this picture is that while core bonds are down a little bit, interest rates have bounced around, as I said, Overall, that market, and it's a very important market, has continued to function relatively normally throughout the year. So let's look at equities for a moment here. And, and again, this is a story that we've talked about. Nope, stay on the, the last page, Josh. Appreciate that. Um, uh, this is a story that you're all probably very familiar with, just the outperformance of U.S. large cap equities, particularly a very small handful of companies. You may have heard the term Magnificent Seven. So these would be NVIDIA. Alphabet or Google, Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, Microsoft, those types of large mega cap tech companies are really leading the charge when it comes to returns for U.S. equity markets. And in fact, uh, stripping out the 10 best performers in the U.S. equity market this year, the rest of the market is kind of flattish overall. So um, you can see what, what effect these 10 best, best companies are doing so far. Um, and then the question is, will it continue um, you know, as long as these companies continue to earn outsized uh, earnings, um, you know, there's there's perhaps some room to run here, although we have seen maybe the start of a bit of rotation here since the end of the second quarter over the last couple of weeks. We've seen some real weakness uh, at the top end of this market, particularly in those mega, ta mega cap tech names. And we've seen a bit of a rotation to other areas of the market like small cap which you can see is the second gray bar there. Small cap was down for the second quarter, um, but still slightly positive year to date to the tune of about 2%. And that's because um, small cap tends to be a little bit more, what we say, cyclically sensitive, meaning that um, cyclic mean, cyclically sensitive means more sensitive to the economic cycle. And so if the economic cycle is slowing, if the economy is slowing overall, um, you would expect small cap stocks to be hit a little bit harder, which we saw during the second quarter there, and I'll have a couple more words to say about that in a moment. But let's let's look internationally for a moment and look at the third gray bar there, international developed equities. So these are equity markets outside of the US, place in developed equity markets, I should say. So places like the UK, Germany, France, Japan, those types of countries. And you can see that while they were down a little bit in the second quarter, they were up uh, about 5% year to date through the end of the quarter. And so Consider this, despite all of the issues outside of the US from a geopolitical standpoint, clearly the conflicts that are going on in Europe, these markets can still produce positive returns. And that's one of the reasons why you know, we continue to remain invested there. Um, and then you look at emerging markets, the fourth gray bar on the right, up 5% for the quarter and 7.5% year to date. 
The other point I want to make here is that having in international diversification in portfolios is, is good and it's positive and it's beneficial. And this is a great graphical representation of that. Both international equity markets and emerging market equity markets through the end of the second quarter outperformed a meaningful portion of the U.S. equity market year to date in the case of small cap there in the middle. So having exposure to equity markets outside of the U.S. benefited portfolios overall through the end of the second quarter. Now, since then, we've seen a bit of a snapback, and this is part of what I mentioned in terms of seeing a bit of a rotation, um, and we've seen small cap stocks really rally pretty hard. Small cap stocks are now through yesterday up about 10% year to date and are now outperforming international markets and emerging markets. And, and that has primarily been funded by decreases in the US large cap market and especially in those high flying tech names, which have sold off a little bit here over the last couple of weeks. So this could be the beginning of a rotation, seeing some weakness in the, those large cap tech names and seeing some of those assets flow out of that space and into other asset classes like small cap, like international and emerging markets. And then finally, quickly on the real asset side, um, I'll skip over the, the first two there, uh, US equity REITs or commercial real estate, and then real assets, which is a broad basket of different types of real assets. And I'm focusing on commodities, which were up about two, uh, 3% for the quarter and up 5% year to date. Um, and we saw some, some significant gains in energy in metals in the second quarter um, as, as uh, uh, supply constraints affected those markets. And I'll have a chart to show you in a moment uh, about what's driving some of that. Josh, if you can flip forward to the next page. One other thing, um, back to interest rates. Uh, and again, just because it's so important um, in terms of financial markets here in the US and globally, I just wanted to point out, first of all, the yellow line is um, the yield curve or, or bonds of different maturities and what they're yielding. The yellow line is as of June 30th last year, 2023. The blue line is where interest rates were as of the end of first quarter this year. And the dark blue line is where we stood as of the end of the second quarter. And a couple points I want to make here. One, we see we still see that the yield curve is inverted. What I mean by that is interest rates at the short end of the curve. So from sort of zero to four or five years out um, are, are trending down. So you're getting the highest rates for cash and then lower rates for bonds with maturities um, um, from there. And that's not, this is not a normalized yield curve. Normally the yield curve is upward sloping, meaning it starts in the bottom left-hand corner there where, with the, where the zero and the 2% are, and then it slopes up in a nice arc and flattens out, you know, 10, 15 years out and, and kind of continues straight from there. That's a normalized yield curve. This is what we call an inverted yield curve. And this is, this is a graphical representation of recent Fed interest rate policy where they've raised short-term interest rates to such a high level that they're higher than longer-term interest rates. And that intuitively doesn't make sense because in a normalized environment, or I should say, uh, investors require more compensation to lock their money up for longer periods of time. That's why you get higher interest rates in bonds with longer maturities. But that's not what we're seeing here with the yield curve inversion. And this has been the longest yield curve inversion on record. It's, I think, almost two years old now at this point, or even maybe even a little older than that. And this is another indication that we tend to see prior to a recession. Uh, typically, the yield curve does invert prior to recession. Now we've seen some yield curve inversions that have not resulted in recession. So it can be a false indicator from time to time, but it is another indication that we tend to find directly preceding recessionary environments. And so I wanted to continue to point that out that we're not, we're not out of the woods yet here. Um, Josh, go forward one more slide, please. Uh, we'll take a look at what I wanted to point out on this slide on the left is equity valuations. So the boxes there are, is the range of trailing price to earnings ratios over the last 15 years. And the dots, the green dot is where valuations were as of the end of the quarter. And the gray dot kind of right behind the green dot hidden there for the US is where we were as of the end of the first quarter. And the point we're making here is that US equity markets are expensive. They are well outside of the 15 year range and way above the 15 year average, which is the blue bar there in the middle of the, the a light blue bar there in the middle of the dark blue rectangle. So listen, it would not be a huge surprise to see a bit of a sell-off here in the US equity market with the economy slowing a little bit, 
perhaps corporate earnings starting to slow a little bit and prices valuations remaining very high here in the US. You contrast that with what we see in markets outside of the US in international and emerging. You can see that while um, these markets have gotten a little bit more expensive since the end of the first quarter, in the case of international develop, they're still well within the 15 year range and they're right in the middle in terms of the average trailing PE we see in those markets. And then emerging markets, sort of similar, popping up out of the range a little bit, so getting a little bit more expensive here, um, but still sort of close to that 15 year range at least. And then on the right, I won't uh, spend much time on the panel on the right, but you can see just the sectors that have done the best um, so far this year and the light blue bars on the right. And of course, information technology leading the way at close to a 30% return year to date. If you go forward one more slide, Josh, one other thing I wanted to point out here, just looking across international equity markets, you can see US there on the left. China had a really strong second quarter, up 7% for the quarter and bringing the uh, return for the Chinese equity market into positive territory for the year, up about 5%. China is the world's second largest economy, very, very important, 40% of the emerging market uh, uh, index overall. And so China has a very important impact on the global economy and global equity markets. And so um, seeing the good returns out of China in the second quarter certainly helped. You see other interesting takeaways from this chart. India, the best performing global equity market, up 10% for the quarter and 17% year to date. Um, and then you see the UK kind of hanging in there around 7%. Um, and then a little bit of negative returns out of Japan in areas like France and Italy, things like that. So it's been a mixed bag across UX equity markets, I'm sorry, across global equity markets so far this year. And that's another reason why we stay globally diversified. How would we pick which one of these markets is gonna do better relative to another one? And when would we know to get out of it and rotate back and forth and all of those sorts of things? Impossible to do that accurately over time. Uh, and then the, the next slide, Josh, the last one we'll show. Again, I just wanted to rewind a little bit and look at commodities and real estate. As I said, energy had a good quarter, up 3% for the quarter and up 8% year to date. Industrial metals and precious metals both had good quarters and strong returns year to date. The only place where we saw negative returns in commodities in the, in the second quarter and year to date have been in agricultural commodities. So all of those commodities that go into food production, which is actually a good thing from an inflation standpoint. So if prices are going down, in the food uh, stocks that we that we eat uh, and that we consume, that should help inflation going forward as well, and which should provide a little bit of cover um, for the Fed to begin cutting interest rates here toward the end of the year. And then um, you can see real estate, which sectors have done best so far this year. Again, a bit of a mixed bag. Um, so uh, Josh, we want to forward to the next slide. It says takeaways here. So I'll talk a little bit about um, some of the takeaways from my perspective. Um, sure. and, and the big ones are, uh, we we are you know we are seeing the economy slow a little bit, notwithstanding the good GDP reading we got today. Perhaps it was a shallow slowdown, and we'll be back off to the races again. Um, but that remains to be seen. We're watching interest rates and Fed policy very very closely. If you look at the interest rate prediction markets, they are signaling that the Fed will begin cutting interest rates in the back half of this year. The prediction markets are signaling a 25 basis point cut in September and another, another 25 basis point interest rate cut in December. So we'll see if that comes to fruition. We certainly think the Fed has plenty of room at this point to begin cutting interest rates. When you take into consideration the current Fed funds rate is 5.5%, and you talk about 250 basis point cuts before the end of this year, you, we would be at a, a 5% Fed funds rate at the end of this year, which is still pretty high, certainly high relative to long run historical averages. So uh, still plenty of room to go in terms of Fed policy. And then and then obviously this recession, you know, uh, doesn't look like we're, we're in a recession now. Certainly the GDP readings wouldn't signal that. Um, will that happen at some point in the future? Yes, but it's, it's, we, don't, we don't seek to predict when a recession is going to happen. We seek to prepare for the eventual recession and then manage portfolios through those recessionary environments. And uh, over time, that proves to be the best way to handle it. Perfect, Joe. Thank you. Wow, that's a lot. Uh, thank you for going through all that and, and appreciate those bigger takeaways, especially as it relates to preparing, not predicting, and also having a, a handle on uh, asset classes overall and how they've performed and looking at diversification as, as key. Obviously, it doesn't you know um, guarantee uh, a gain or loss. It's, it is important from a risk-adjusted return perspective and and hedging those bets. So, so appreciate that. I'm going to give you a chance to catch your breath and kind of look at things from, from
from Azad's perspective, uh, folks who in regularly interact with uh, our financial advisors know well that we we do try to hammer home those those timeless ideas of diversification and avoiding market timing, uh, instead opting to focus on time in the market, and also understanding that uh, it's important to stay invested, even at new highs, uh, and even if it means you want to deploy more capital. So if you look at the first half of the year, uh, we obviously did hit new highs. They came fast and furious in the first half of 2024, and the S&P 500 in particular uh, notched a slew of fresh records. Historically, new highs tend to cluster together. Um, those, you know, yesterday's performance notwithstanding, and forward-looking returns when investing at an all-time high are not meaningfully different from returns when investing at any time. So we have gotten this question throughout the first half of 2024. Hey, I've got some capital set aside. There's cash on the sidelines. When should we think about deploying it? Uh, the answer is you might want to you might want to have again a conversation with your advisor. But looking historically, it hasn't been harmful if you have invested at or near all-time highs. Going back to 1970, for example, if you invested in the S&P 500 at an all-time high, your investment would have been higher a year later, 70% of the time, with an average return of 9.4% versus a, a 9% average when investing it at any time. Uh, at both records and, and non-records. So uh, important to uh, keep things in perspective, understanding, of course, that uh, past performance doesn't guarantee future results, but important nonetheless, and obviously making those decisions in consult with a financial advisor at his odd, that's essential. So many think that the recent momentum of new highs that we saw in 2024 can continue, but uh, if it doesn't, uh, don't worry. Um, it's it's actually not a bad thing. History has shown that stock market declines are a natural part of investing. And yeah, we saw one yesterday. Um, going back, it's one of the worst since December 2022, I believe. While declines, they varied in intensity and frequency, they've been somewhat regular events. And so it's important, again, to keep things in perspective. So sharp, sudden market declines, they are disconcerting. Don't want to discount that. We get that. They prompt many investors to reduce their stock holdings or pull out of the market. That's that's where the problems rear their ugly head, because as history has shown, financial markets have rebounded from stock market shocks, posting strong long-term gains. All too often, investors that have sold out during a crisis, and Joe alluded to this point earlier, those folks have locked in losses and possibly missed the rebound. So riding out market declines and benefiting from potential rebounds may, in fact, be a better plan. It may also reassure you to know that the market has always recovered from declines, although, again, past results don't guarantee future results. Remembering that downturns have been temporary may help assuage some of those fears. Lastly, I'll mention, and again, we've hammered this point home many, many times, don't try to time the market. It's time in the market that matters, not market timing. No one knows the perfect times to get in and out of the market. So consider holding quality investments with the potential to rise in value over the long term. Have a plan and uh, conducted and created and consult with your Azad advisor. And remember that you don't need to get it right when, when the, I mean, sorry, you would need to get it right when getting out and back in, in, in order to make it work if you were trying to market time. So it's very difficult, but, Again, we don't counsel that. We are long-term investors focused, again, on diversified portfolios. And with the help of experienced financial professionals like Joe over at Fiducia and many others, our many portfolio managers, as odd, has helped clients achieve competitive risk-adjusted returns that set them up to succeed long-term and to avoid making decisions that could jeopardize their long-term investment goals, which often remain unchanged during market declines. Another important point to remember. So again, that point again, Azad has helped those clients, just like you, persevere through those market ups and downs. We'll now turn to questions. It's time for the Q&A portion of today's webinar. Please use the Zoom chat feature to ask away. I'm going to take the presenter's prerogative and start with a kickoff for Joe. You mentioned the AI trade in your remarks today, Joe. What's your what's your view on that um, AI trade, which we've seen through the first half of the year? Are the Magnificent Seven, those mega cap tech stocks, enough to propel the market higher, which they have been doing? We saw they've struggled as of late. It was, was that a bubble? Is it temporary? How, did, how is that going to shake out in your view? So I'll start off by saying um, AI, artificial intelligence, 
uh, machine language, uh, large language models, all of this is revolutionary. Uh, and the way I think about it is uh, this technology will change our lives like the internet changed our lives in the late 90s and early 2000s. Uh, and that's kind of how the, the analog that I use to, in terms of thinking about this and where we are in this part of the cycle. It feels like we're somewhere in the late 90s here um, as it relates to the, 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 the current AI uh, situation, meaning that it's clear that this technology is critical and will change our lives. What is not clear is who the winners and losers, which, which companies are gonna win and which companies are gonna lose and how it's ultimately going to impact us over the long run. Um, and so there will be tremendous volatility around, uh, around this until there's more clarity. Um, one of the things that most people don't realize is, you know, take Amazon, for example. Amazon stock has declined 90% two times since it, was, since it originally IPO. Um, and so that gives you some sense of the potential volatility um, that can happen, uh, uh, it, it, notwithstanding the fact that Amazon has done exceedingly well overall. And, and that's one of the reasons why we um, would never advocate for, you know, outsized allocations to very narrow areas of the market, like large cap, mega cap tech, like the Magnificent Seven, you should have exposure there. That's important, but that should, exposure should be commensurate with sort of overall market levels and you know personal risk uh, objectives and, and investment objectives. Um, because what happens is, is these companies, you know, uh, continue to track asset, continue to attract assets. They represent a larger proportion of the overall equity market index. So when when People are buying, that's good. They get the lion's share of the new dollars and they go up in value. However, the opposite is, is true as well. When people begin selling, they lose the lion's share of the assets and, uh, and tend to go down further faster than other areas of the market. Um, and so we expect to see you know, significant volatility in that space. Can it continue from here? Certainly. Is it going to go continue to go straight up and to the right in a parabolic fashion? No. And we would not want to try to time when that would happen, but the the I, I, you know we 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 don't try to predict what's going to happen here. But what we can say is we know there will be volatility around the space in the market because it is so new and it's so uncertain how it'll ultimately play out. Yeah, thank you. And again, I'm reminded of that adage you evoked earlier of preparing, not predicting. So it's a it's a great point. And then obviously oh, we're in the thick of earnings season right now, and and clearly things are. Things are still shaking out, but I am curious just to go back to a point you made earlier about that "quote unquote" great rotation. Is that starting to take place? What what should investors do to maybe position their portfolios? Should they at all? I mean, people have talked about small caps being you know an outsized beneficiary of interest rate policy in the second half of the year. Um, value also is looking uh, a lot better. Um, is, is this rotation taking place and should investors react accordingly? I think I know the answer, but I'll go ahead and let you take that one too. Yeah, well, I mean, certainly we've seen a rotation uh, since the end of the quarter. Uh, as I pointed out when we were going through the materials and the presentation, small cap has done exceedingly well over the last couple of weeks. Um, and, and, you know, you saw in the sell-off yesterday, small cap was down less, uh, significantly less than large cap. Today, it's up significantly when those other markets aren't up quite as much or we're down at the beginning of the day here. Um, uh, we are also seeing a lot of interest in the diversifying asset classes like real estate, like commodities, real assets in particular. Um, and that's just a function of, you know, again, interest rates likely, uh, inflation expectations, excuse me, likely to remain sticky through time here. And also folks looking for other areas to go, other areas outside of U.S. large cap equities, which have massively outperformed all other areas of the market really over the last five years, but even going back to the financial crisis. So uh, it's hard to say if this rotation, uh, you know, is gonna be sustained, will be a sustained trend going forward. Um, uh, I do think that uh, if, you know, if and when the Fed begins to lower rates, it will, it will be a tailwind for areas of the markets like small cap which you know, tend to have higher borrowing costs anyway and tend to have to have more debt on their balance sheets to fund their operations. 
uh, relative to the size of the company. So if interest rates are coming down, that's a that's a positive for that area of the market. Uh, so um, I, I'm not going to guess and tell you that no, one way or another because I don't want folks to uh, act on that in, in the wrong way. But I, I will say that um, it's been very interesting to see how markets have evolved over the last couple of weeks here. And it seems fairly logical with where we are in the economic and interest rate slash Fed policy cycle. Perfect. I think that's a great answer. And obviously we would counsel folks who are interested in you know, any sort of move with their portfolio to do that and console with their Assad advisor. I have another question for you here, Joe. Stock market prices reflect expectations for future growth. The market looks out several months and trades accordingly. In the next few months, of course, it says here we will have elections in the U.S. Is the news of a new Democratic candidate already priced in? Are markets betting on a more business-friendly Republican administration? Should investors position their portfolios in anticipation of this? So several questions there, but just broadly, your your take on the upcoming November elections and their potential impact on uh, markets and the economy broadly. Yeah, uh, it's a great question, of course, and, and uh, certainly front and center. Uh, I would start by saying that historically, election years have been good for equity markets. On average, the S&P 500 has returned 11.5% in general election years going back to uh, the Great Depression. Uh, so it, it, it's, it's generally been positive. Um, certainly, though, um, there is a lot of uncertainty around this particular election cycle. Uh, the, the, the change from Joe Biden being the candidate to now Kamala Harris um, you know, is it is it priced in? Well, the answer is yes, because we know that 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 she's going to be the, the 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 nomination at this point or the nominee at this point. I guess there's high degree of certainty. So markets are pricing in that eventuality. What I think the question is, what potential impact would that have after the election? Um, and uh, markets tend to, um, I should say, it hasn't mattered much if you look historically in terms of. Uh, uh, how markets have performed, whether a Democrat has been in office, whether a Republican has been in office, um, the, and then you have to factor in the other branches of government as well, uh, namely the the the, um, the legislative branch. Um, it, it, there isn't a big correlation whether it's Republican or Democrat, um, but I will say that this is a unique, certainly a unique time, um, and we could see some volatility around the election. Um, and historically, the pattern in election years has been the opposite. You've seen volatility at the beginning of the year. And then as it becomes maybe a little bit more clear who's the front runner, who's the likely winner, markets tend to smooth out and actually increase into the election and, and through the remainder of the year. Like everything over the last couple of years, we could get the opposite outcome this year, given the uncertainty and everything that's taken place thus far. So again, I think the only thing that we can say is expect volatility given the level of uncertainty. And then after that, after we after we know who the, 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 the winner will be, then we can start to think through what are the policy implications? What are the economic implications? What are the market implications? We don't, we don't trade portfolios based on who we think is going to win or lose an election because first of all, it's a binary outcome. You're either right or you're wrong. And even if you get that decision right, if you actually pick the winner, uh, the markets may not react the way you think they're going to react based on who won. And so it's just it's just another one of those things that that you cannot predict accurately over time. And so um, it's it's unactionable in portfolios, as we say. And we pay more attention to what are the policy implications, what are the economic implications, and what are the market implications. Great, thank you. I keep coming back to that quote from your uh, from your talk earlier. Just you know, prepare, don't predict. I think that's a great takeaway as well. So uh, in, in light of the time, let me just go ahead and give folks a quick preview of some of our upcoming webinars. We wanna take the opportunity, since you all are gathered here today, and thank you again for being here. We wanna inform you about our upcoming webinar schedule. Uh, our, our next webinar will be a financial literacy workshop. Uh, we're off August, but coming back in September, to handle that. And then in October, we'll follow that up with case studies in Islamic state planning. So be on the lookout for more information soon regarding the dates, times, and how to sign up. 
that will conclude today's presentation. I'd like to thank our special guest, Joe Cortese, for being here. And a special thank you to all of those of you gathered here today who took the time to be here with us live. If we didn't get to your question or if you'd like more information, please do reach out to us. The email address is hello at azadasset.com. Also, be sure to follow us on YouTube using the handle at Azad Funds. You can find us on LinkedIn under our full name, Azad Asset Management. Thank you again, everybody. Have a great rest of your day. And, and thanks again. A special thank you to Joe for being here. My pleasure. Thank you. Thanks.